and I'm delighted to be able to welcome Matthew Taylor to our winter school this year. Matthew uh, is the chief executive of the, the RSA and has supported um, events uh, run by Academy Wales in, in the past. Matthew has um, uh, invite, will be inviting questions through, throughout his session, so he will pause part way through, then invite questions at the end. So as Matthew progresses through his session, if you have any questions, please post them into the chat. I will review the, the questions to make sure that I can um, collate them. And then when Matthew pauses, I will relay your questions to him. So over to you, Matthew, and welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's great uh, to be here, particularly because uh, I found myself a few minutes ago in a kind of digital cave, unable to get out. I don't know whether people noticed, but I had to send a message to the chat saying, uh, will somebody please connect um, with me, which is rather confirmed my view about the use of technology in talks. Um, uh, the organisers of the event asked me on several occasions whether I had PowerPoint or slides, and I I don't use PowerPoint. And the reason I don't use PowerPoint goes back a long way. It goes back about, I don't know, about 20 years now. I was running the Institute for Public Policy Research um, and we had a presentation of our work and it was in front of the world's press. I think it was live on Sky News, actually. It was an enormous event. And I had asked um, my intern to do the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and he was great, but he was Scandinavian. I think he hadn't, he'd made rather uncritical use of the spell check. Anyway, the first slide went up in front of ministers, media, and it said on it, daft recommendations. Uh, of the IPPR Commission on Pubic Private Partnerships. So um, ever since then, I've been kind of rather averse to using any kind of technology at all in my talks and, and just speaking. Of course, the other thing that's really challenging uh, about um, these events, of course, is I'm sure that you found the anecdote I just told you incredibly funny, but I have no idea because, of course, I can't hear. Um, and that's rather kind of disconcerting when you're doing a talk. It, 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 it reminds me, and I'm sorry to start with a couple of amusing stories, but, you know, we all could do with a smile, couldn't we, at the moment? But it reminds me of a story my father once told me that he did a talk in the European uh, Union once. Remember the European Union? Um, and um, uh, when you do talks in the European Union, some of you may have, have had this experience. They have booths all around where they have people doing uh, um, the simultaneous tra um, uh, 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 translation. So he said to the translators before they came to meet him, the interpreters, and he, he said, look, I'd like to tell jokes. Would that be OK? And they looked a bit doubtful, but they said, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. So, you know, as he got into his talk, he thought, well, I'll try out a couple of these jokes. So I think, you know, you, they're all very cheesy. They're dad jokes. You know, I think he he told the joke about the, the man who goes to the doctor and says, doctor, doctor, uh, I think I'm a moth. And the doctor says, well, I, I can't help you. You shouldn't be here. You should have gone to the uh, psychiatrist next door. Why did you come here? And the man says, well, because your light was on. Uh, so I think he tried that and he might have tried uh, another couple of jokes uh, like that. Um, and when he told the joke, there was a pause and then everybody laughed and he was quite pleased with this. So actually he told more jokes than he would normally tell in this talk. Um, and at the end, he was very pleased. He got all the he got all the interpreters together. He said, "Well, thanks so much, you know, for that." And um, uh, th that seemed to go very well. And um, uh, well done for the way you did the jokes. So everyone laughed. And um, I, how did you do the one about the dog with no nose? And then the 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 lead uh, um, uh, translate uh, interpreter turned to him and said, "Oh no, uh, Professor Taylor, we we didn't repeat the jokes. We simply, when you told a joke, we simply said, and now Professor Taylor is telling a joke." Uh, and so throughout the entire talk, people have just been laughing out of politeness. So, um, but feel free to laugh out of politeness. That's perfectly satisfactory from my uh, perspective. So um, I'm going to talk about change. I'm going to talk about change in general. I'm going to talk about what's happened over the last 10 to 11 months and how we might use that. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what I think are the priorities as we start to think about where we go next. I want to start by, by just recognising something, and it, and it may be different in Wales, it may be different for you, but I've noticed this, that when we went into our first lockdown, there was an enormous amount of talk about how we want to build back better, uh, how things are going to be different afterwards. And maybe it's because we're still not absolutely certain about how we're going to emerge from this crisis, or maybe it's exhaustion, or maybe it's the shattering effect of 
the hope we had last summer and then the abandonment of that. But there's much less talk, it seems to me now, about how we might use the crisis to build something better. And I, I, I want to say I, I believe uh, I believe this is the darkness before the dawn. I believe that because of the vaccination and the evidence that we've got about how quick we how quickly we can adapt vaccinations even when there's new strains. I and now that the vaccination seems to reduce transmissibility, which is an enormous game changer. I do think there's a real prospect that we will move to uh, a, a new, a different normal, but a kind of post-COVID world, a world where COVID is not our number one pressing priority. And and I, I think it's really important then that we don't stop having that conversation that we were having much more actively in a, in a strange way last year, which was how do we use crisis to achieve change? So just a quick word about that, about that idea, first of all. So what we can say if we look through history is that crisis doesn't always lead to change, but that crisis very often does. So crisis is more likely, change is more likely in the wake of crisis than at other times, that is to say major change. And secondly, that whilst change is more likely after crisis, sometimes that change is powerful and good, and sometimes it's not. So, you know, an obvious example for us all is the contrast between what happened after the First World War and what happened after the Second World War. After the First World War, there was a, a mini boom, but many of the issues had not really been resolved that led to that First World War and way in which we handled the end of that war, laid the foundations for economic uh, decline, polarization, political polarization, social inequality, and the disaster of the Second World War. In contrast, after the Second World War, we policymakers had learnt the lessons. One of the interesting things about the Second World War was the amount of conversation during the war, the determination to build back in a different way. Uh, of course, the exemplification that would be the beverage uh, report. So there's two examples of very different outcome in terms of the way in which crisis led to change. If you want to look at for more recent examples, I would point to the AIDS epidemic, and I, many of you have been watching the really powerful Channel 4 series recently about this. Now, this is a, a terrible, terrible thing, uh, particularly for those communities that were most affected uh, by it. And I lived through that time. I remember the kind of fear and the sense of the possibility that people would be stigmatized, the ignorance that people uh, had about the nature of that of that disease but yet ultimately we emerged from the AIDS crisis not only with solutions which mean that uh, AIDS being HIV positive is no longer a, a, a terminal or even a chronic condition it's a completely manageable now but also that laid the basis for a fundamental shift in public attitudes towards the LGBT community um, and that was to do with the, the way in which that community responded to that crisis, decided not to disappear, not to hide away, but to come out and to fight and also develop a, a different kind of model of health around self-care and around community support. Contrast that to the global financial crisis of 2007-8. Again, if you remember a huge amount of talk, if I had been speaking to you in the middle of that crisis, we would have had a conversation saying we must learn the lessons and we must do things differently. And yet, Despite some regulation of the banking sector, really many of the underlying things that contributed to that global financial crisis and that were exposed by it weren't addressed. And of course, we saw inequality has remained the same. We have social polarization, political uh, polarization. So we did not use the global financial crisis as a, as a reset. So COVID is a once in a lifetime experience. You know, I, I have an eight year old daughter. She'll be thinking about COVID, talking to her friends about COVID for the whole of her long life and that and this year and what she's gone through and what it's meant for. So it's a major thing. But the question is, how do we use that? How do we use that? How is it going to change us? Now, if I had time and this was a focus, we could talk about that at a kind of societal level. And I'm very happy to answer questions about what I think might be at the societal level, the big shifts. But I want to talk to you more as a kind of more granular level, which is to, to think about how organisations in the public sector, the third sector, also the private sector, have responded to this crisis and what the where the learning might lie. Now, I don't know if you had time to read the piece that I circulated uh, beforehand, but through the RSA's work with a whole number of organisations, we developed a kind of 
a typology, um, a, 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 a two by two matrix of the forms of response that people um, uh, and organizations have made to this crisis. And we identified four different types of response. So the first is kind of crisis related responses, which were important in the crisis, but we would not expect to or even want to continue those afterwards. So we, you know, we don't clap anymore on Thursday evenings. We obviously want, don't want the NHS to have to continue counselling routine operations. So these are things which we do in a crisis, crisis management. So the important thing there is not to hold on to those things. You know, there's no point trying to encourage people to continue to clap or whatever. That's not going to happen. Certain forms of community mobilisation are around the crisis. And we know from lots of research that you will get some falling away of that when the immediacy of it, of it, of it passes. But still, there is learning to be had. I think it's really important that we look at some of those ways in which we responded and learn from them. What do we find out about ourselves? What do we find out about our organisations in that kind of crisis adaptation? The converse of that is things which we have done, which of course we would want to keep. So bits of learning, bits of development, which we'd be crazy to want to let go of. And the most obvious in the public sector has been digital, where there has been um, in large parts of the public sector, a real leveling up of our use of digital tools. Now, I would have said before the crisis that the number of local authorities who truly understood what it was to be a digital local authority, it's not just about technology, but it's about the nature of the services, the nature of com communication, even the nature of democracy, was very, very few. But I think now a lot more local authorities get that. And of course, we've seen the use of digital in terms of our engagement with the NHS and a, variety, a whole variety of other things. Um, so in this area, the important thing is that we want to hold on to those gains that we have made. Another area has been the way communities are mobilised and connected with each other. They may not be able to maintain that intensity that we've had in the crisis, but those links, the platforms they've used, you know, in my street, we formed a WhatsApp group and um, and it was mainly around responding to the crisis and cooking and taking food to the hospitals and things. But we might stop doing that. But actually, I think that network will continue to exist. So how do we get that going? Now, in that area where we want to hold on to things, it's partly how do we make sure we do that? But it's also let's just notice whether there are things that we need to attend to because we have changed. So, again, in digital, the obvious question there is if we've moved much more to digital by default, what does that mean for the people who aren't connected, the people who don't have broadband, the people who don't have digital skills? How do we address that digital exclusion issue, which might be much more pressing now we've moved to a more digital by default world? The third category of things is, is the kind of where the, the question here is, well, we changed. Do we need to go back? Do we do we need to go back to the way we worked before? So I'll give you some examples. There's office working. You know, um, I think that people enjoy the camaraderie of working with other people. And I, I think I suspect that most people will want to go back to working in the office some of the time, at least. But I suspect that this kind of hybrid working, going into the office, but working more often from home, recognising that, for example, meetings, most meetings are just as good remotely as they would be in person. So, you know, I, I suspect we people say, well, we don't actually have to go back to kind of presenteeism. Um, I've seen local authorities in particular use kind of different ways of thinking about procurement. You know, forms of procurement that were quite bureaucratic, quite slow, maybe this is particularly an English issue, but quite competitive. And instead, local authorities in particular had to just get the money, I've seen this in Welsh examples, get the money out to civic organisations, third sector organisations to trust them and to trust that they will use the money in the most effective way. And, you know, generally speaking, you know, we'll find out in due course that there were maybe issues and problems with that. But generally speaking, people, I think, have felt that has worked better to work on the basis of, of trust um, and um, uh, doing things at pace. So do we need to go back to those more bureaucratic ways of working? Do we need to go back to office working? So I think interesting questions there about how we sustain some of the innovations that we've had in the crisis, even if we aren't going to continue to work in that kind of crisis setting. And then finally, which is a subtly different, it is those things which we are going to go back to. 
inevitably. But can we do them better? Because it is in the nature of processes, public sector processes, any organisational processes, that they get kind of silted up over time. You know, more things get added to them. They become more complex. They become detached from their first purpose. So when we put those systems back in place, can we do them in more effective uh, ways? And one area I'd give you is, is performance management and appraisal. You know, those systems had to be very different in, in the crisis. We probably put them aside, largely speaking. It, it didn't feel like it was a priority. But we, we need to go back to that. We need those kind of systems. But can we do them more intelligently? Regulatory agencies that have had to regulate in different ways over the crisis, well, maybe they can regulate differently. Maybe they can regulate more virtually rather than uh, necessarily having to do it in person. So I think in that area, as we restart those processes that existed before the crisis, let's have a look at them. Let's have a look at whether or not we can remember why they were in place and whether we can do them more effectively. So we've used this framework with a whole variety of organisations and, and they found it very rich. You know, what are the things we did just for the crisis? What are the things, of course, we want to keep, but the issues that will raise? Do we ever need to go back to those things? And yes, we do have to go back to those things, but can we do it better? And we found it's been an incredibly powerful framework for um, uh, managers, uh, workers, stakeholders to get involved in. Um, and if anybody wants to talk to the to me or to the RSA about about working with you on that framework as a learning framework, and now I think is a really good time to be using it, then I'm very happy to, to talk about how we can do that. So let me just in my kind of closing part of what I want to say, identify some of the kind of broader lessons that we have learned, lessons and opportunities that we have learned from the engagement that we've had with organisations throughout the last uh, 10 months. And I don't think as I go through these lessons that they are new. And that's not surprising. You know, there's very little that's new in the world. You know, I think change, I've come to realise over my long career, change is as much to do with timing as it is to do with new thinking. You know, it's it, what, what, what happens is an idea has been around for ages and then suddenly the moment arrives when that idea clicks. So when I talk to you about what we've seen in organisations, these are, these are things which, which organisations, good organisations should practise anyway, but we've seen more of it in the crisis. And there's an opportunity maybe to take these ideas and really embed them. So there are five I want to talk about and, and I'll, I'll run through them quickly. So the first is, is leadership. We have seen different styles of leadership in this crisis. We've seen more open, more engaged and more authentic forms of leadership. You know, and part of that is for kind of odd reasons. You know, if you can see the soft furnishings of your boss or their children or their pet running across the screen, you know, it's difficult for them to be pompous. Um, uh, I, I was talking to the um, chair of a major corporate the other day who said that the chief executive had gone from a rather pompous quarterly speech to staff to a weekly fireside chat. So leadership has change and, and you know the challenges for leadership are great and more profoundly really in many organizations they've had to operate in a much flatter way during this crisis so i think as leaders and i'm a leader myself we shouldn't try to re-establish necessarily the forms of leadership which we had before we have operated in this more engaged more open flatter way more human way very often and we need to sustain that as we move out of the crisis, not fall back into the habits that leaders, all of us leaders tend to have. So that's that's the first thing, new forms of leadership, new styles of leadership. Secondly, purpose. You know, it is some, it is simply in the nature of organisations that, that the purpose of what we're doing tends to get obscured behind the processes, the bureaucracy, the day to day. And, and one of the challenges in all organisations is to continuously renew that sense of purpose. And we've seen fantastic examples in this crisis of organisations asking really profound questions about purpose. I, I love the example we put in the article that I think I sent round of, of the theatre group Slong Low in Leeds. And they're a community theatre. And right at the beginning of the crisis, they thought, well, you know, people can't come to the theatre anymore. So what are we going to do? Just close the door? They thought, well, no, actually, we've got a space. We've got a space in the middle of this rundown neighbourhood. People know us, people trust us. And so Slong Low went from being a kind of moderately uh, 
successful community theatre to being an incredibly busy local food bank. Um, and its staff were repurposed to working in the food bank. And, I, you know, that's just fantastic. And for that, for them, you know, the point was that our purpose is to engage and to empower and to support our local community. And right now, sitting in a theatre is not the way we can do that. Running a food bank is the way that we can do that. So I think a lot of organisations during this crisis returned to their core purpose, thought about their core purpose, and so that's a really good opportunity for us. So how do we do that? How do we how do we ensure that we continuously renew our sense of purpose and not require um, not require uh, uh, that to, to be not 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 allow ourselves to be obscured by the day to day and the process? So how do we continue to put purpose at the front of our conversations? The third thing I've I've, re I've referred to already, but I, I, and so I'll, I'll pass over it quickly. But that that's engagement. A lot of organisations realised very early on they needed to have much richer engagement. So we've seen kind of, you know, many organisations like the RSA conducting very regular, short, sharp staff surveys, you know, because we were concerned about well-being. How was it for people to work at home? Were they able to, to work at home? You know, we've had continuous kind of feedback sessions. And actually, interestingly, of course, one of the advantages of remote working is it's actually easier to get everybody together for a meeting. Uh, than it is when you have to do it in person. So I think how do we ensure a continuous dialogue with staff, with 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 um, service users, with the public? Um, you know, I think central government, national government has got an awful lot wrong, but that's a different speech. But what is interesting, of course, is that they have realised, although they've got a lot wrong, that they have to continuously engage the public in a conversation uh, as this crisis has evolved and changed and because they need the public to do the right thing. So I think engagement, rather than seeing engagement as something you do occasionally, seeing engagement as an essential part of how it is we deliver what we do and create uh, trust and think about, for example, services as relations rather as, as relationships rather than things we just deliver. So engagement is the third part. The fourth part, and again, I, I've seen interesting examples of this in the material I've, I've been sent about Wales, is collaboration. I mean, collaboration, as you all know, is one of those words that people use all the time. But real collaboration is actually quite rare. But in this crisis, we've really seen it. Uh, um, and the places that have responded best, that has been probably the single most consistent finding has been we really actually mobilised together. Whether it was in England, the competition between different parts of the NHS was put to one side in a concerted effort. Local authorities and the health service working more effectively together. I've talked about a different model of procurement with the voluntary sector based upon trust and collaboration rather than and kind of detailed specification of contracts. So we've really seen a step change in collaboration and I think it's going to be very important to take advantage of this moment to, to think about well, what is it we really want to achieve in the post-crisis period? And, and can we achieve the same amount of consensus around that shared, uh, those shared objectives to maintain and sustain that collaboration? And then finally, the, the other thing that we've seen in the crisis, which I think we really need to hold on to, is kind of responsiveness or agility. I mean, even the banks managed to get money out, the loans out to companies very, very quickly. They adopted a kind of get the money out, ask questions, first ask questions later approach. Central government has not been afraid to announce schemes and then to adapt them almost in real time as they realise what's working and what's not working. And, and often you focus there on, on, on what goes wrong. But actually, I would say that form of kind of policy making, that much more agile, adaptive form of policy making is absolutely what we need. The old model you know, where it takes years to get a mandate to do anything, it takes years to implement something, it, you know, years to find out whether it's working. And then by the time you have found out, you know, politicians have changed, you moved on to something else. You know, the way that we made policy in central government to a lesser extent in local government was too slow, it was too lumpy, it was too path dependent. And so that kind of greater agility, that willingness to test things out and learn and adapt, which we've had to do in the crisis, that too, is something that we need to hold on to as we move forward. So look, I'll, I'll, I'll finish there. Had I been doing a talk in normal times, I, I would have talked about the way the RSA encourages organisations to think about change as a whole. And there we have a phrase, it's a bit of jargon, I'm afraid, but a, a, a phrase, we encourage organisations to think like a system, 
and to act like an entrepreneur. So to understand issues systemically, but to try to achieve change through an entrepreneurial mindset of experimentation and adaptation. And I think those key lessons from the crisis around more engaged, authentic and open forms of leadership, a continuous and uh, a continuous and, 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 and relentless pro uh, focus on purpose, a commitment to continuous discourse and engagement, real collaboration around purpose, and a kind of agility in terms of how we do things. If you put all that together, that is what we've always meant at the RSA about thinking like a system and acting like an entrepreneur, a kind of approach to change. So that, it seems to me, is the opportunity. And, and what I would encourage you more than anything else, and again, I let me repeat the RSA's offer to help you with this. Don't let go of what you can learn from what's happened over the last year. It's an enormous learning opportunity. And however tired we are, however worried we are about new strains of the virus or whatever, the odds are we are going to move out of this. And the thing that we would probably be most self-critical about in years to come would be that we moved out of this and we didn't glean those lessons. We didn't take the inspiration from the crisis and apply it to the enormous challenges that we're now going to face. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. We we have you with us until um, 11.30 this morning. So um, there are a number of comments and reflections um, in the chat. Um, and there is a question that I'd like to, to go to. So what I would like to do is, is, as I'm asking this question, if there are other questions that delegates wish to um, pose to, to, to Matthew, please put them into the chat and then I'll whiz, whiz down to those. So we've got a question from Katie Knott, um, who talks about how do we encourage better coordination across organisations to look at the changes required? Uh, Katie goes on to say in, in her health board that she's noticed a lot of silo working uh, with a resistance to working together and wonder whether this is partly driven by the threat and a need to do rather than take time to reflect and join up with others. It's tricky to move people out of this, this threat state. What are your thoughts and reflections on that, Matthew? Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a very well made point. And I would, would go to the issue of purpose here, which is that, you know, well, I, I actually two P's, purpose and process. So let me explain. Um, I think that too often when we create kind of um, forums of coordination or collaboration, we plunge straight in to um, making decisions and agreeing strategies and whatever without spending the time we need to spend in really checking in to make sure that we do have a shared and common sense of purpose and a shared and common analysis of what we need to do together. I think it was Abraham Lincoln who once said, if you have seven hours to chop down a tree, you should spend six hours sharpening the ax. And I think often what we do when we work together is that we have spent no time at all sharpening the ax. And the sharpening of the ax is spending the time to ensure that we have a sh deeply shared sense of common purpose and analysis, shared data, so that we're all on the same in the same conversation. Now, then people have got different things to deliver, different responsibilities. And of course, there'll always be tensions. But if you've put that investment in, you can come back to it. You can come back to it and you can say, well, in what way is this contributing to the purpose? Or have we lost sight of the, 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 the goals that we really agreed together? So that, that that's purpose. But I think you know, if you're going to achieve purpose like that, you mustn't underestimate the work that needs to be that is involved in it. So I had a very poignant um, event just before lockdown, literally. It was about three days before lockdown. We all kind of knew what was coming. But if you remember, the prime minister was still kind of resisting it. And it was a meeting with senior civil servants and people who run arm strength bodies in, in central London. And I was talking there about thinking like a system um, and acting like an entrepreneur. I was, saying that seems to me the way that we need to address issues, complex issues, understand them as systemic issues, imagine different systemic solutions, but adapt a very agile and experimental way of getting from here to there. Now, everyone agreed with this. So I then said to people, look, you're going to go into groups now, and I want you to tell me, what is the, what are the things which most enable you 
to think like a system and act like an entrepreneur? And what are the things that most inhibit you from being able to think systemically and act entrepreneurially? And what was fascinating to me was they came back with the same answer to both questions. And the answer was process. So what they said was, when the process is well facilitated, it puts the time into agreeing that there is a sheer, shared sense of purpose. It's inclusive and egalitarian. Every voice is respected. It's not kind of hierarchical where people, you know, only speak when you're allowed to speak. But but there's a sense that everybody there has got something to contribute. There's a real sense of outcome. There is the 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 the, the capacity to follow through and make sure that things are done and that people continue to be in dialogue. Well, then you can achieve a lot. But when the processes are not properly facilitated, they're not outcome oriented. They are hierarchical. They are formal. There's no real follow up when after meetings and discussions take place. Well, then that is kind of catastrophic. So I think my answer is to, to the question of how it is we work effectively together is to put the time into agreeing a sense of purpose, agreeing an analysis, agreeing the way that you want to do things together, however long that takes. Because if you can't agree that at the beginning, the fact that you haven't agreed it is going to be exposed sooner or later. So it's always a good investment of time, however difficult it is. And then to ensure that the processes of collaboration have those characteristics that I've described, which which in, ensure that that work continues to take place. Um, and I think we just don't put enough emphasis on purpose and process, to be frank. A lot of the time we, we, we charge into a room together. We assume we all agree about things. We assume we all want the same things. And we have meetings where half of us are checked out, you know, 10 minutes after the meeting started. I mean, what a bloody waste of time. But, you know, am I the only one who has that experience? <laughs> Great, thanks, Matthew. And you've certainly stimulated the grey cells. We've got lots of questions coming in now. So I'm going to go to a question from Mark Knight Davis. Uh, basically, he was saying, what is your level of confidence that organisations will not go back to old ways of working? Huh. Well, um, you know, I, I, I hope this doesn't sound precious, but I, 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 I don't make predictions. So I have I just resist the idea of, uh, you know, being optimistic or, or, or pessimistic because I, I you know, because ultimately I think it's up to us. So, um, you know, I, I could sit here and go, well, I think it's all going to be much better. It's all going to be much worse. I, I'm not sure that that's a useful use of my limited you know, brain cells. I think the critical question is, you know, we know that it could go either way and we need to think about what are the things that are going to determine it. And, and as I say, historically, there's evidence for both sides of this. It is important, however, to be realistic. And that is, you know, um, uh, the, the, to recognize that you cannot maintain the same level of mobilization and single-mindedness out of a crisis that you have during a crisis. And so the question should not be, how do we sustain exactly this kind of intensity beyond COVID? Because that's not realistic. And that's why, we use the framework that we use because you need to think about the different elements of how you've responded. And some of them will be relatively easy to sustain, you know, like the work moving more digitally, working more digitally because they're common sense and, and people have acquired new skills. Others will be more difficult, like collaboration. So that's why I think it's really important to be quite forensic and looking at what's changed over the last year in order that you can think hard about what will be required to sustain what has been positive and can be sustained, to let go that which is unlikely to be uh, sustained and, and particularly to avoid creeping back in those things which weren't working even before the crisis started or those things which were exposed by the crisis. Great, thank you, Matthew. We, we've got uh, a question from Daniel Madge. What role do you think the arts will have in delivering public services like health and social care, policing, housing, etc.? cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let me say you know, a couple of things here. I mean, the first is that I think one of the good things about the crisis has been, it really has reminded us of the importance of arts and culture to our well-being. You know, it, it's been really interesting, the number of performers and artists, some at the kind of global international scale, but a lot of them kind of locally, who've recognised that, that, that their creativity can really help people at a time like this. And, you know, children You've, one feels that particularly acutely with, but with lots of other people as well. So I think that the artistic 
cultural community has really leant forward into this crisis and thought deeply, and I gave you the example of that theatre group in Leeds, but really thought deeply about how it is they can make what they do accessible uh, to people. So I think that probably the sense that arts and culture is intrinsic to our sense of well-being is more strongly felt now than it probably was a year ago. And that's a real opportunity, I think, you know, that those of us who are enthusiasts for the role of arts and culture in, in, in society um, uh, who may, maybe found it hard to make that argument. I don't think anybody would have can, can, can underestimate their role because we've seen it over the last year in a whole in a whole variety of ways. And we've also seen the way in which arts and cultural organisations have adapted, you know, whether it's the National Theatre putting their plays on uh, and making their plays available as, as, as one example, but all sorts of other smaller scale things that we've seen as well. I mean, in, in the article that I think we circulated, we had the example of, of, of some stuff that DJs have done to to create a new business model in the face of the fact that they weren't able to to, to get people coming to events uh, anymore. So that's the first thing I think I'd say. Um, the, the, the second thing um, uh, is is really about kind of how we think about how arts organisations think about their role going forward. So I, I've I've quite often spoken at local uh, um, uh, groups of cultural arts organisations. There was a, a movement I think it still exists called What's Next, which was about trying to make the case for more funding for arts and culture. And this, you know, emerged out of the kind of deepest points of austerity. And whenever I went to those meetings, what I heard from arts, cultural and heritage organisations was a kind of how do we put up, how do we make our ask? How do we how do we best express our ask for more resources and for more consideration from local and national decision makers? And my response to them was always, I don't think you should start with what's the ask. You should start with what's the offer. You know, what I would be doing if I uh, in, was running a you know, local so, you know, group of, of, of cultural producers, arts producers, heritage producers, I would go to my local chief executive, to the chair of my local health board or wherever it might be. And I'd say, what we want to do is we just want to hear what your issues are. What are the challenges you face? And having heard what your challenges are, we're going to go away and think about what contribution our sector can make. Because actually, when you listen to the kinds of challenges that a local authority chief executive might describe, how do I engage citizens might be one of the challenges that they would describe. Or um, how do I deal with issues about well-being and mental health, which I have in my community? Or even how do I foster greater collaboration and creativity and innovation amongst public sector in the public sector? Now, all of those are questions that arts and cultural organisations have got fantastic answers to because they are organisations that are all around engagement and they're all around creativity and they're all around kind of touching people's hearts and minds. So uh, I think there is an opportunity now that didn't exist a year ago to make the case that arts and cultural institutions are at the heart of effective place shaping, at the heart of what makes, pla uh, makes places succeed, uh, makes communities succeed. But rather than taking that moment and saying, OK, that's great. Now we can ask for more money or we can ask for this or we can ask for that. I would just turn it and I would say now we're taking now people can see this. Let's just think about how we as a sector might be able to help other local agencies, social agencies to be able to uh, achieve the things they need to achieve and overcome the challenges they face. If you do that, the conversation can be completely different. Great. We've got we've got a question here from Catherine Fuchs. The pandemic started as a health crisis and I believe is now a crisis of inequality. How can we apply your model to ensuring, for example, gender equality and especially race equality doesn't get worse during the pandemic and as we come out of it? Yeah, so I think that there has been overall, I wouldn't want to exaggerate this, but I think there has been overall a boosting of a sense of social solidarity in this uh, crisis. Um, we have felt a strong sense of our deep um, uh, um, uh, debt to key workers, for example. We have become acutely aware of different outcomes in the health system. And of course, the Black Lives Matter moment in the middle of this crisis, you know, strengthened uh, all of that. So I think there is a greater awareness amongst the public 
of systemic inequality. And there is a greater commitment to social solidarity than there was at the beginning of this uh, crisis. But that is a moment that we have to use. And I think that it's interesting the way that you expressed the question. In a way, I would I, I think that health may be the best way to untie this. So rather than saying, well, we had a health crisis and now we've got an inequality crisis, I think what I'd say is we need to recognise that our health crisis is our inequality crisis. That one of the most pernicious expressions of inequality is differences in health outcomes. You know, is the fact, thinking of London where I live, that people in Barking and Dagenham, um, you know, that the, at the average healthy life expectancy is, I think, 55, whereas in Richmond it's 73. You know, the, the people have become aware of that. And I think that moving to a population health approach is one of the things that we really need to get out of this. And it's it's something that even, you know, even the conservative, conservative ministers recognise, uh, is that the future for the health service has got to be to move away from a focus primarily on the health service as being about hospitals and acute care and move much more to a recognition that the health service is around population health and it's around setting objectives for population health, improving the health of the population and critically reducing those health, uh, health inequalities. So I think um, let's keep talking about health. It may be that health is the best lens now, building on people's experience of COVID, the best lens to win support for the kind of action that we need to take to reduce those glaring inequalities. Because I think that of all the inequalities, all the ways we can articulate inequalities, those inequalities in health are the ones which strike people as being the most stark. So I think if we start from that, if we say to the public much more explicitly, uh, and, uh, and not just in public health, but across the health service as a whole, that closing those health inequalities is absolutely intrinsic to the success of our health system, then I think that's a good starting point for a, 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 a more robust conversation about addressing inequality. We've got a question here from Mark Atwell. Um, what do you see as the potential shifts in the economy and the role of the state? Does your experience of COVID to date with support payments make for a stronger case for concepts like universal basic income to allow society to absorb shocks like a pandemic better? Yeah, that's a, a really good uh, yeah. a really good question. And um, yeah, I think that, uh, that you know, we have learned some interesting things about the way our welfare system works, about the people who fall between uh, the cracks. Um, there are, of course, going to be many people who are now facing the challenges of interacting with the welfare system, with universal credit, who hadn't been doing that uh, before. I suspect the appetite for radical change uh, in this government may be quite limited. But I do think that there is a shift in the conversation that it is possible to be having with people. And I think that it is interesting that support for universal basic income, which is a policy I, I support, albeit I support a very modest form of universal basic income. So I'm not talking here about a kind of universal basic income, which enables everybody to kind of live um, a life of uh, relative kind of luxury. I'm talking about really simply a system in which the, the welfare minimum is one which everybody is able to get without having to go through systems of conditionality um, and which they can get even if they're doing training or doing volunteering or, or whatever it might be. And I would be ambitious to go beyond that, but I think that's the starting point and the RSA has costed out a, you know, a feasible universal basic income, a kind of starting point. So, you know, it's interesting to me that support for universal basic income has spread and it's spread not just from the kind of enthusiasts to more people, but it's also not just, you know, people on the left who support the idea. There are other people who are, who are interested. So, yes, I think that is an example of the kind of issue that we need to be looking at. I think there are others, too. My I don't I want to be, as you can hear, resolutely positive. I, I guess my question is whether or not this government has got the bandwidth. Uh, I'm talking here about the UK government has got the bandwidth or the intent to be able to, to 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 think about those more radical shifts. But, you know, we have now a more credible opposition party in the UK again. Um, and, you know, it may well be that as they start to develop their ideas, some of these ideas move more into the mainstream. It'll be very interesting to see what happens in that regard.
Great, thanks, Matthew. We've got a question here from Andy, which is uh, one posed to you in, in your role as a leader. What is the thing that you've missed most from the last 12 months and how do you intend to bring it back? You know, I think that human interaction, face-to-face -face interaction, it's a bit like vitamin C. I, I don't think you notice that you've not had it for quite a while. And then you start to realize that you're a bit under the weather psychologically. So, you know, I, I'm kind of all right working at home. I, you know, quite enjoy knowing my daughter's in the next door room and I go for a run every morning and, and stuff like that. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm lucky, you know, uh, I bought the inevitable lockdown puppy, which by the way, was a is a disaster, but nevertheless, I'm stuck with it. So, um, you know, I, it's all been kind of fine, but I have realized in the last few months in particular,